Hey, good afternoon. My name is Gary Callahan, and today we will be talking about the principles of flight. First and foremost, what is our purpose in understanding the principles of flight? Well, the purpose as stated here, and this is taken from um, a good reference, is to understand the forces acting on an aircraft, both in flight and on the ground. And to understand the theories in the production of lift, airfoil design, and wingtip vortices. And of course, as we progress, we will understand why these are um, incredibly important. While none of these theories and um, principles can be understood perfectly every single time, it helps us give an understanding of how an aircraft flies and maybe the effects you feel as a pilot, um, such as stalls, G-loading, um, slips and skids, and more of the stuff that we'll get into. But this is essentially a very basic overview of the principles of flight. You'll see some of the pictures as well as the overall information um, is taken from the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge, also known as the PHAC, the Aviation Flying Handbook, and the Aeronautical Information Manual. So, let's start with the basics. And luckily I found a little picture of um, looks like a regular old Piper Cherokee. Um, aircraft basics, there are three main axes that a aircraft pivots around. You have your vertical axis, which is right here. And if you pivot about your vertical axis, um, that will give you your sense, or not your sense, that will give you your moment of yaw. If you pivot um, about the longitudinal axis, that will give you um, your bank. And if you pivot around your lateral axis, which goes from wingtip to wingtip, that'll give you your pitch. So how does this correlate um, in flight? How do wings work? You know, those, this is just three simple axes, but that's definitely not all we need to know for how an aircraft flies. Another good thing to note, uh, and this would be something as we get to the next task into the PTS about aircraft flight controls, um, your pitch is controlled with your yoke, pushing it down and pulling it back. Your bank is still controlled with your yoke side to side, kind of like a car steering wheel. And then your yaw is controlled with your rudder pedals. But like I said, that's more in the flight controls PowerPoint. Next, let's talk about some airfoil terminology. Now you may be asking yourself, what the heck is an airfoil, right? Um, this, these animations and these pictures would be kind of looking down on um, the edge of the wing. So this would be the bottom of the wing and this would be the top and this is kind of like splitting the wing in half, I guess you could say. Does that make sense? You know, kind of just looking down the wing. An airfoil is essentially anything that aids in the production of lift. If you're ever, you know, driving in a car and stick your hand out a window, you notice as you stick your hand out, maybe you create an angle right there, your, your hand will go up and down as the car goes faster and faster. That's essentially how the aircraft is flying. So the first um, part is the camber of the wing. This will give the wing its very distinctive shape. You have two types of camber, really easy, an upper and a lower camber. So this is, would be the upper camber and this would be the lower camber. Um, now there are two trailing edges that give us our um, cord line and mean camber line. This would be our leading edge, which is just the very front part of the wing and the trailing edge. Now I mentioned cord line and camber line, what the heck are those? Um, the cord line is an imaginary line that runs from um, the leading edge to the trailing edge and then the camber, um, the mean camber line is kind of, if you take the mean distance of the lower camber and the upper camber and made an imaginary line through that. And while that doesn't really necessarily affect us as pilots and how we fly a plane, it's good to know when it comes to the characteristics of, as we'll get into the angle of, angle of attack um, in a second, as well as pitch and plane up and down and things like that. Really, really exciting stuff. We'll get to center of gravity in a second. Um, center of pressure and angle of attack. Angle of attack is the angle of the airfoil's cord and the relative wind. Um, a really simple way to look at this, I mentioned um, about sticking your hand outside the window. Um, if you were to angle your hand against the relative wind, so 
the relative ones coming this way and you increase the angle of your hand, that's going to increase your angle of attack and thus that's why your hand starts to rise. Um, that's essentially what an airplane does whenever it flies, is when you increase the angle of attack, it increases lift and it also shoves your center of pressure forward. This is your center of pressure right here. If the angle of attack increases, let's say this way, the center of pressure is going to rise up the wing and eventually you'll get into an aerodynamic stall, which we'll get into in a little bit. But this is very basic, just flight principles um, that we're talking about. And then of course the angle of incidence, which is um, the relation of the cord line to the longitudinal axis. So this would be the angle of incidence. This would be a Cessna 172 or whatever. Um, if the cord line is angled this way and then the pretty much the fuselage of the aircraft is angled this way, this would be your angle of incidence. Does this all make sense so far? Cool. Let's talk about airfoil design. Um, once again, I'd say airfoil design is a really good thing to know as a pilot uh, because of, especially because of the stall characteristics and how the aircraft will react um, at certain airspeeds. Now, airfoil, like I said before, is anything that aids in the production um, of lift. And the plan form is more or less what the wing looks, at, looks like as viewed from above. And then last term before we can really get into what an airfoil design is and um, the characteristics associated with it is the aspect ratio. Now the aspect ratio is the ratio of the wingspan to the wing cord. Now all of these um, at the root might have similar cords, but if you have a really long wing, that's going to give you a high aspect ratio versus a low aspect ratio. Now, if you notice the difference of these, these are more what you find in gliders, and these is what you find in, let's say, fighter jets. So, which means, you know, if you just use your brain for like two seconds, this means um, it's much more favorable at higher airspeeds. While you are going to, the plane is not going to be as stable at lower airspeeds flying through the air, it will be very stable at super higher speeds, and this is the type of um, airfoil design that helps you break the sound barrier and things like that. Like I said, this is what you find in gliders. And um, gliders, as you know, can fly at very low airspeeds and can fly forever if you find the right sort of thermals to bounce you back up into the air. That doesn't really matter. What matters though is the airfoil design, low and high aspect ratios. This is a high aspect ratio good for gliding and lower airspeeds. And this is a lower aspect ratio good for higher airspeeds and um, much worse stall characteristics. Now we could go over the airfoil um, and you know airfoil characteristics and it looks really interesting I know um, but I'd say all you really need to know is how this affects lift most importantly the symmetrical airfoil and the symmetrical airfoil is something you find let's say in air show pilots um, because it gives you similar amounts of lift, whether you're upwards or inverted. And we will get into right now, I believe, um, how an aircraft produces lift. So there are four main terms, right? All this before was kind of monotonous and boring and confusing, but hopefully how lift is created will be a little bit more entertaining. I don't know. So you have lift, weight, thrust, and drag. We're, we're going to talk about lift first. Lift is the upward force um, acting on an airplane. Weight would be the downward force. Thrust would, thrust would be the forward force. And drag would be the backwards force. So what does this even mean? And how does an aircraft produce lift? Well, there's a few different um, theories. The first one being Bernoulli's principle, which kind of goes into pre pressure differential. Bernoulli stated that as a fluid... Um, increases in speed, it's pressure, it's overall pressure in that, let's say like square um, cubic meter or whatever, is greatly reduced. And at lower air speeds, it is increased. So if you know anything about basic physics, there's this whole um, relation of high to low. Like if there's high pressure and there's low pressure, the high pressure is kind of going to be sucked up into that lower pressure, um, which isn't essentially what Bernoulli's saying here. 
but it kind of is because nobody like we have many theories of lift and it works and we can predict it but no one really understands how lift works which is scary because you have these people flying these planes but we know enough right we have very very smart aeronautical engineers that make these planes and make them safe so you shouldn't really be worried but um, the more you look into it the more you really realize that we don't really know or, or at least i don't really know you know i'm just learning what someone else has already figured out so Bernoulli's principle as the velocity of a fluid increases the pressure is decreased so it's an inverse effect and then as the velocity of a fluid decreases its pressure increases because just think of it if you have a curved surface on the top and then a flat surface on the bottom and you have a particle of air moving over the surface and they meet at this trailing edge at the same time the particle of air moving over the top is going to have to move faster than the particle of air moving over the bottom to get to this point at the same time. But you may be asking yourself, if you're really following here, what about the symmetrical wing sections, right? Wouldn't they be producing the same amount of pressure on both sides? So does Bernoulli's principle explain exactly how a wing flies? No. But I think Newton's third law more or less does. Because we talked about the angle of incidence in the aircraft. So if you have all this thrust being produced this way, like with the longitudinal um, axis of the body. And then you have the angle of incidence of the wing this way. The wing is going to go into the wind and the wind's going to deflect down and essentially give you that lift. So that's kind of what Newton's third law is saying. It's like pretty much if the wing hits the air, the wing's going to go up. Um, but there's many, there's not many theories of lift. Of course you have the lift formula, but it's kind of confusing once you really start to think of it. And let's talk about weight and thrust. Weight, like I said, is the downward force of the airplane. And weight is always, it's never not, it's always um, pointed towards the center of the earth, right? Weight's never gonna act upwards or sideways or anyways. And like, like I said, this is the principle of flight. It's very easy and it's very monotonous, and, um, but it's something you have to know. And then thrust is the force created by the, the propeller. And if you notice here, this is the kind of side view of a propeller. Here's the, you know, nose cone and the propeller. Um, it's essentially like a wings airfoil, but just put the other direction, right? And so essentially what a propeller is, is just another wing opposed in a different direction to give you thrust in a different direction. It's pretty straightforward. Um, as that propeller spins, it kind of bites into the air right here. The air comes up, or the propeller kind of goes into the air, the air is deflected, and then the propeller is pushed this way. But if it's very fast, like the propeller moving hundreds of times a second, that's why we get all that thrust. Cool. Which then takes us to drag. And drag's a big one, right? You have two main types of drag. Paradise, parasite drag, and induced drag. Parasite drag is essentially all the drag created um, from things that are sticking out of the aircraft, or maybe the aircraft has like really rough textured skin versus an aircraft that has very smooth skin. Um, more drag is gonna be created. Drag is the opposing force of thrust, right? An airplane just can't fly forever if it is able to be in the air. Eventually, the wind's gonna keep hitting it. With every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, and that's gonna be drag pretty much to the ground. But we have two types of, of drag, parasite drag and induced drag. And induced drag is actually um, a byproduct of lift. So how do these relate to your airspeed? Because it, you know, I could explain these all day or I'm trying to, right? Um, but how does this really relate to the airspeed? How I memorize it and how I would teach my students is Parasite drag is positive of the square of the airspeed, which means, let's say you're going at 40 miles per hour to make it as simple as possible, or 40 knots. And parasite drag is going to increase with that airspeed. So the faster you go through the air, the more parasite drag you're gonna have. The more, let's say, those antennae or the things sticking out of the aircraft that are hitting the wind and dragging the plane down, the more they're going to be in effect. 
Um, it's like whenever you hold your hand out the window, right? You have all that force opposing you, and then you slow all the way down, you don't have any force opposing you anymore. So that's essentially parasite jack, right? And then induced is the inverse. So parasite positive, induced is the inverse. And inverse just means opposite, right? As your airspeed increases to infinity, your induced drag is going to decrease. An induced drag is the bi is the byproduct of lift. And we will get more into that in a second with wingtip vortices. But first off, let's talk about um, airplane stability and controllability. Is this all making sense? Okay. <laughs> um, airplane stability and controllability. Two big terms. Um, airplane stability is the tendency for an aircraft to return to an equilibrium after disturbed, which essentially what's that saying is let's say you're flying straight level at a constant altitude of 3000 feet and you push the nose down and let go. A really, really stable aircraft is going to come back up to 3000 feet and settle there. So that's essentially what stability is. Um, maneuverability and controllability are two um, big terms because controllability is the effectiveness that the aircraft responds to control inputs. Controllability goes up with airspeed because you have more air flowing over the wings, which means more air to deflect off of your ailerons and whatnot, which we'll get into in a second. Um, but maneuverability is essentially the ability for the plane to be whipped around and you know barrel rolls and all this crazy stuff. And what the designers have to do when they make an aircraft is compromised between maneuverability and controllability. Because if you had an incredibly maxed out maneuvered aircraft with maneuverability with no controllability, it's just gonna be chaos and it's gonna be stressful because you won't be able to control it. But yeah, if you have this super, super controllable aircraft that's not maneuverable at all, you wouldn't be able to turn it, right? So they must make a compromise between those two. Let's say with airshow pilots, those are very, very, much lean on the maneuver the maneuverability side and then the big jets would be on the controllability side um does that make sense with the with those two terms okay. cool and you have two different types of stability um moving on is you have dynamic stability and of course everything i'm mentioning here i'm not mentioning it just to take up your time all of this are terms that you need to know let's say especially for your private pilot check ride or commercial pilot check ride. These are very important terms. I'm not just filling up a PowerPoint. I'm actually making this as short as I possibly can um, for this task so you won't miss anything. Dynamic stability, you have positive, negative, and neutral, as well as static stability of positive, negative, and neutral. Um, positive dynamic stability would be whenever the airplane's pitching up and down, and it's called oscillations. Positive um, stability, is once that aircraft is disturbed, eventually it'll come back to neutral flight. Um, negative would be it increases more, and then um, neutral would be it just keeps the same amount of, of um, instability, I guess. And then you have static stability. Or static stability, um, positive, negative, and neutral. Positive is where if he nose it down, it'll come back up um, to an equilibrium. Negative is to where if you nose it down, it actually continues nosing down worse than you actually intended. And then neutral is if you nose it down, it will just keep that same pitch and won't get worse or better. It's neutral, right? Um, you have three main types of stability, of longitudinal stability, and this is the stability around a certain axis, that being your um, longitudinal axis. And this would actually be about your longitudinal axis. And what does that even mean? Um, like I said, longitudinal axis, runs from the back of the plane to the front of the plane, and this is kind of this direction, um, kind of pitching up and down. So you, stability about the lateral axis. And this is really related to your center of gravity. Center of gravity we haven't gone over yet. Center of gravity is the tendency, or pretty much the point, to where you can stick a pencil on the plane and the plane would perfectly better balance on that pencil, right? So it's like, Okay, so the center of gravity is pretty much the pivot point or where the plane would perfectly balance out 
um, if it were balanced on a point, kind of like a seesaw, right? Um, so that's the center of gravity, and this very much affects your stability about the lateral axis, because if you have all this weight moved forward of the aircraft, it's going to want to push down, um, which then takes us to lateral stability. Um, lateral stability is about the lateral axis going from wingtip to wingtip, and this is essentially the stability of the aircraft um, in regards to roll. You don't want it to roll too much, um, and you really want it to be stable about the, the lateral axis. Exactly. Um, so that simplified would be the stability that an aircraft has to not just start rolling left or right. And then you have vertical stability. And verticus, vertical stability is kind of looking um, over the top, and it's the stability of an aircraft not to yaw left to right um, too abruptly, and it's pretty much vertical stability. It's kind of it's kind of hard to explain more than um, the definition. How does an airplane turn? Okay, you you might be wondering like Garrett, how the heck does an airplane turn? I just don't understand it. I don't get it. Um, there's two main terms here. You have the horizontal component of lift and the vertical component of lift. So the, hor the horizontal component of lift in straight level flight when you're not turning left and left and left or right is essentially zero. And the vertical component of lift is equal to its weight in straight level flight. Um, but as you turn, that vertical component of lift, right, as you start to turn, starts to pretty much create a force that's going out this way. And so as you bank more and more, so does your horizontal component of lift, your vertical component of lift. That's why whenever you bank over, you have to pull more back on the yoke um, so you can maintain a level turn as you turn around, right? So that's essentially how an airplane turns. Um, and as you're turning, there's this whole phrase called stepping on a ball that, um, and a slip and a skid. And this is a good example of it here. Um, if you don't know what a turn coordinator is, essentially this, this little airplane is showing your rate of turn, pretty much how fast you're turning in a circle. So if the airplane's kind of level right here, you're not turning at all, so your rate of turn would be zero. But as you bank more and more, so does the airplane, and that will give you rate of turn, like I said, how fast the airplane's turning in a circle. And then if you've ever been in a car, and if you've ever turned in a circle, right, you always feel like you want to be pushed outside the car and it's no different than a plane. So let's say in a skidding turn, like in a car, if you turn too abruptly, you start skidding, um, the ball will start to swing outside of the turn. And all this ball is, is a ball encased in a tube of liquid. And so if you're in a skidding turn in the air, all that G load is going outside the turn. And so this ball is just going to naturally follow that because it's just a ball encased and a tube of liquid. It's very simple. Um, and this would be something more that you'd have to dive into. But as I say these terms, just essentially look them up because there's so much and I cannot fit this inside a normal 25 minute video, right? Let's talk about our four turning tendencies and then talk about stalls and we will be done. Um, so you have four main turning tendencies, which if you've ever flown a plane ever, and you're flying and you have full throttle and you're taking off, as you pull that yoke back, the plane start starting to wanna to turn to the left. So why is that? Well, the first effect um, whenever you're taking off is the torque effect. Newton's third law, every action, every action there's an opposite and equal reaction. And if the propeller's attached to the front of the plane and the the plane is attached to the whole thing, right? And the propeller is turning this way, it's gonna to create torque to turn the plane this way. So at higher air speeds, you can't really tell this is happening, but at lower air speeds, you can definitely tell and we'll start to make the plane um, roll a certain way. You have the spiraling slipstream. So whenever the propeller is creating thrust, um, it will create this stream of air like being um, twisted around the aircraft that hits the tail and then will give you that turning tendency to the left. Gyroscopic precession is 
Um, something that we need to know, uh, precession. What is precession? Precession is the tendency for a fast moving gyroscope or disc. It's moving really fast. If you put any sort of pressure on one point, the resulting effect would be 90 degrees later. So for example, you can see here, it's very tiny, but if this was a, a spinning disc and I was to kind of put pressure on this part right here, um, the resulting force would be 90 degrees later in the turn. And as we all know, a propeller is turning very fast. So as um, that propeller is taking the bite of air on one side, um, the resulting force will actually result, this is like really, um, this is really monotonous, right? Um, but, the, but the resulting force will be on the right side of the propeller, which is gonna make the plane yaw to the left. It's gonna kind of yank it over. P factor does not exist, and it's just, it's really, it's it's pretty stupid. I don't I don't think P factor exists. So let's move on. Load factors in airplane design. Okay, what the what the heck is load factor? Load factor is the ratio of the total load acting on an airplane and the weight of the airplane itself. For example, in straight level flight, when you're just chilling, let's say on a passenger jet, um, and you're not really feeling any different than sitting on the ground, your G load, how pr pretty much how heavy you feel is going to be. 1G. But if you've ever seen those videos of people in um, kind of the astronaut training when they have the people sitting down and they're pulling all those G's and their skin gets really tight across their face, um, that is because the resulting force, let's say in that pod or whatever, is 12 times the normal amount because of the G loads. And so this is the total load acting on the airplane versus the aircraft's weight. So if we had two Gs and the aircraft weighs 2,000 pounds, that would be 4,000 pounds acting um, upon the aircraft. And you can have negative Gs as well. This is a VG diagram. Uh, this actually will get you your stall speed, your accelerated stall speeds, things like that, um, which we'll talk about in a second about stalling. Um, you can have negative Gs, which is where your body's being forced upwards in relation to the plane, or positive Gs when your body's being forced into the seat. If you're pulling two Gs, you're gonna feel like you weigh 400 pounds, right? If you weigh close to 200 pounds. Um, and then you have the effective load factor upon the stall speed of the aircraft. Um, if, if the stall speed listed in an aircraft, let's say is 50 knots, which, it, which is the speed, if you slow down to enough, that the aircraft will fall out of the sky and stall, um, and we're in a turn and pulling two Gs, that can actually increase up to like 70 knots. So it's good to know the load factors um, in relation to aircraft design. Wingtip vortices, um, these are very important to know. It's essentially the resulting force of the air moving over the top of the wing and the bottom of the wing, creating kind of a, a pattern behind the wing that can is not really noticeable in smaller aircraft, but is definitely noticeable in bigger aircraft. Because these wingtip vortices, think of it, these massive aircraft that weigh you know, hundreds of tons that same force that's required to lift them up is being backwashed pretty much by all the air coming off their wingtips. So all that force can easily flip your plane if you're behind them. So you really, really, really want to avoid big jets, wingtip vortices, and usually in controlled towers, they'll tell you, but if you're in an uncontrolled airspace and there's a jet taking off and you get in their wingtip vortice path, it can kill you, right? You don't want to have that. So during takeoff, you want to rotate prior to the other aircraft, if taking off here, landing, you wanna stay above and land beyond their touchdown point because right when they start producing lift, those wingtip vortices will knock you out of your seat and kill you, and you don't want that. Whew. Ground effect. Ground effect is a phenomenon that we can actually predict, and it's something that we understand, but it's more understood whenever you're flying and you feel it in the air. Ground effect um, comes into play about half a, plane, a plane's wing um, span. So if a plane, let's say from wingtip to wingtips, 30 feet, I don't know, the, um, the, the ground effects would come into play about 15 feet above the ground. And ground effects 
contrary to popular belief, is not a cushion of air, because it feels like a cushion of air, because ground effects is whenever you're coming into land and you're really close to the ground, you get a slight increase in performance, and it's like you're on a cushion of air. The ground effect is actually the reduction in induced drag because we no longer are producing such great wingtip vortices. Um, and that's gonna give us naturally better performance. So it's never a cushion of air, that's, that's just not true. And the last thing to talk about is low speed aerodynamic cells. We talked about high speed aerodynamic, aerodynamic cells very you know, rapidly, um, let's say with great load factors, um, increases your <coughs> your stall speed. Um, but an aerodynamic stall is, an aerodynamic stall is the result of many things, such as really low air speeds, high load factors, increases in angle of attack. Um, but essentially, and you'll learn more about this as you get into more technical charts and whatnot, or just more into the private pilot ground course, whatever you're taking. Um, a stall speed, and I, I had no idea about this until my commercial training, is whenever your um, critical angle of attack has been exceeded, right? And critical angle of attack varies with, um, or it doesn't vary. Your airspeed, your stall speed will vary, but your critical angle of attack will never. So, Look more into critical angle of attack and really what it is, because if that is ever exceeded, then your aircraft will stall. And here's a good example, a good diagram of it, because if you notice, the more an airfoil um, increases its angle of attack into the relative wind, all this wind will start getting disrupted and you have a reduction of lift until eventually none of this wind behind it is creating any lift and then the aircraft stalls because it can't really fly anymore. Because it would be very hard for this to fly. Just think of it in, in your head if this airfoil was vertical, right? Because you just have all that air hidden and just fall. So anyways, um, that is very, very briefly the principles of flight and the terms associated with them. I could, it would take me hours to really sit down and walk you through everything, exactly what it means um, but there you go. I'm Garrett Callahan and have a good day. How long is that?